So, uh, one of the reasons that I like your writing and one of the reasons I wanted to talk to you specifically, well, one of the biggest reasons was because you're willing to take on, uh, I'm not sure how to say this otherwise, but I, like unpolitically correct <laughs> issues and positions. Um, and I've become like really super bored with the, the liberal slash progressive, whatever you want to call it, hot take cycle, which I'm sure many of us have at this point. Yeah. Um, and so I wanted to start off by talking to you about one of your more controversial pieces, which, um, was about detransitioners. Yeah. As you're aware. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Um, That was the, that was the first one. That one, uh, that one really put me in the hot seat. That was like the, the worst backlash. Well, that was the beginning. So when I wrote this piece, so this was in uh, like summer of, it was it was June, it was Pride Month. That was one of the many complaints about this piece is that it was published in Pride Month, which is apparently a sacred thing and you cannot, uh, you cannot question any part of LGBTQ ideology during the month of June. Uh. Um, so this was in 2017 and it was um, to introduce your uh, listeners, this was a, or viewers, this was a, a deeply reported profile of a few different people who had detransitioned. So clearly going from one gender to the other and then back. Um, and it was, you know, I looked at all the research, I looked at the literature, I talked to experts in the field, I talked to happily transitioned people, I talked to people who, you know, detransitioned. And I thought that I had had written this like I knew there was going to be a backlash, but I thought that I had really like covered my basis in terms of also including the voices of happily transitioned people. Like I asked for an interview with Julia Serrano and Brent Tannehill and all of these people who sort of speak for the trans community. And I thought by including those voices, I would sort of like cover my basis. No way at at all. It was there was a huge backlash. Um, and I knew that that was coming, but I didn't realize that it would like affect me. I thought like, oh, I'm fine. Like, this is just going to be like voices on the internet and I'll be able to mute them and it will be fine. I I just really hadn't had the experience of like being in the hot seat before being under a dog pile. And then what happened was that like, I did of course get that backlash from the internet, but I also got it. I'm a lesbian. I've been in the queer community for 15 years. And I got it from my friends, and I got it from people I know, and people I don't know, famous queer people were dragging me, and it was a huge, huge shock to be like, oh, this isn't just random people on the internet who've never met me, these are like actually people in my community who are, like, even now, like two years later, I'll, I'll like be like, oh, I haven't seen this person in a while, and I'll like look someone up on Facebook, and I'm like, oh, we're not friends anymore. Oh no happen you know so shit like that happens all the time in Seattle I live in Seattle and it's a very um Seattle's a monoculture in a lot of ways at least the queer community in Seattle and I got sort of just like kicked out like I don't go to queer spaces anymore um most of my queer friends have dried up in the past couple of years so after I came out when I was 20 and I'm 35 now so almost 15 years of like this really being my sort of political, my political home and my social network, it just all sort of evaporated overnight, um, which was weird and terrible. But it also like, I think you've probably gone through a similar experience where it something like that opens your eyes to a lot of the problems on your own side. And so I had this sort of, over the course of months after that, had a lot of sort of revelations about the things that I had thought were intractably true. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, so it was interesting and terrible. But yeah, good. yeah. I mean, that kind of thing is so harsh, especially was, and you've written about this, obviously, when it's coming from your own side and kind of from your own people in your own community, because it's, it doesn't, I mean, it's easy if your enemies are calling you names, because you can just call yeah. them names back, and you're you like, whatever, I don't care, you suck too. <laughs> yeah, and this, like this, like a couple days ago, so after this happened, and I started sort of writing more about um, sort of uh, purity politics and cancel culture and uh, people and I, I'm still a liberal my all like my politics haven't actually changed that much um, you know I still like I vote the same way that I did before but you know like the uh, so like Republicans and conservatives when I would write things about critical of the left they would reach out to me and 
then they find out what I actually believe. And I'm still like a hardcore leftist in most ways. And like, and like the other day, someone who works for the Trump administration, I tweeted something about um, something like, um, you know, North on this governor of Virginia, if he wants to, to save his political career, all he needs to do is change parties or like, you know, Republicans really all of a sudden, they're like really caring about racism right now that it serves them. And this was, was retweet or quote tweeted by somebody who works for Trump, some woman with 400,000 followers who I'd never heard of before. And I got totally dogpiled by the right. And I just muted it and was like, okay, I checked in on it today. There are like, you know, 13,000 retweets, several thousand uh, angry comments. Everybody's mad at me. And it just doesn't matter because it's like, all right, so a bunch of Trump supporters think I'm an asshole. All right. Surprise. Big deal. I don't, yeah, it's just like it's so the, – the experience is so different and so revelatory, uh, revelatory when it comes from your friends instead of your enemies. Yeah. So, I mean, so did you find it kind of, like, liberating at all? For sure. Oh, yeah. I, I It's really sort of changed everything for me. Um, and in the process – so in the two years since then, I've been on this sort of um, – this – I guess a sort of intellectual journey in some ways. And I find myself now, like I started, I started questioning, you know, like I was, I was raised as I raised as a feminist. Um, and I started looking more like things that before I just took for granted as true and right. I started looking at the empirical evidence surrounding them and it really changed me in, in a lot of ways. And so I'm at this point now where I'm really trying to get away from identifying with any sort of ideology. So like my own identity as a leftist, I don't think that should be important, or my identity as a feminist. Because when you're wrapped up, when your own identity is wrapped up in these these, you know, ideological positions, I just I think it becomes, for me at least, almost impossible to look at them in a rational way mm-hmm. and to critique them in a rational way. And so I've I've been on so right now I'm sort of on this on this journey where I'm I'm becoming like non ideological. My politics haven't actually changed at all, but I just don't want to be I don't want to be so tied up in being an environmentalist or a feminist or a woman or whatever that I can't see reality. I can't see the evidence as it as it actually stands. Right. Yeah. I mean, I've kind of been going through that also, which is like quite yeah. awkward because my whole career has been like based on me having a particular identity. And, yeah. And like you, like it's not necessarily that my politics are changing so much because I still am a socialist if you get right down to it and I still am a feminist if you get right down to it but it's tough because you want to start questioning things that you took for granted and that you kind of accepted without thinking about or that you just repeated over and over and over again right. and there's right. so much fear around it's like oh well, all these people mm-hmm. might turn on me because you're not right. supposed to do that and then right yeah. and they will they will turn on you but there's also this, you know, this, like I saw your, I saw your, I watched your conversation with Megan Dom the other day, which was great. And she's brilliant and great. And I think there's, you know, for a lot of us going through this process, there is this good sort of like online community of people being like, oh shit, like that all, like this whole, the IDW thing. So before that, and I think that is an incredibly stupid term and I like have some, some problems with this idea of a movement because I don't think that, I think that anytime something becomes a movement, the sort of tribal identity gets wrapped up in it and then you, you the same problems can emerge um, with audience capture and just sort of um, being intractable with your ideas because you identify so much with this like subculture or whatever. Um, but so before the before Barry Weiss wrote her big thing on, on the IDW and Eric Weinstein coined the term, in my head I was calling this uh, I was calling it the white pills, right? trying to articulate to people like something is happening. I'm not like I'm not becoming a conservative. I'm not becoming a men's rights activist, but I'm finding that there's a lot of people on my on the left side of the political spectrum who just every time we like criticize the left, we're just getting dogpiled. And maybe that maybe this has always happened. I don't know. Um, you know, and social media just exacerbates it. Um, but so, and then that, I think that sort of the thing that I was trying to grasp, trying to hold on to ended up having this like silly name, intellectual dark web, but sort of this idea of like, okay, there's this other thing, there's the left and the right. And then there's this other thing that could maybe encompass the good ideas and the bad ideas of both of those. Yeah. I mean, ideally it's like, you're not trying to jump ship from one group to another group. Like what you're just trying to do is think critically and independently and ask questions and make sure that your own ideas are solid. And especially, you know, like as a journalist, it's like you want to be reporting 
accurately and un, you know in an unbiased way of course we know that's not in, no one's really right. unbiased but right and it's very difficult to do that if you feel obligated to put forth a certain ideological narrative for sure for sure and i you know i think that that that's true of someone in my position too so um so even though i i try not to sort of toe the line when it comes to any ideological narrative there is this sort of danger of like oh so is my brand going to be the contrarian you know and i and i need to like be the contrarian which i don't i don't want that to be my brand i want my brand to be like person who looks at empirical evidence and makes decisions based on the evidence you know just like rational just like somebody you know what i mean just like not captured by ideology and i think that no matter what position you find yourself in if you start getting feedback if you start getting an audience then there's this danger of that you know potentially well that becomes your thing mm -hmm. um i wanted to talk a little bit more specifically about the detransitioners article and that backlash just for you know maybe people who didn't follow it mm -hmm. Um, what, I mean, what were people saying to you in their, in their responses? A, a lot of the same stuff that you get, um, you know, and it's not, that isn't to say that, that, that there aren't good faith critiques of the, of the piece, but the piece, um, was really, I write a lot of, so the paper that I work for the stranger is the out weekly in Seattle and we have this sort of, um, unconventional blend of journalism and opinion writing. Um, and we don't really make any distinction between the two. So a lot of what I write is opinion based or it's reported, but also there's a lot of opinion and this piece wasn't that. Um, so the funny thing is I don't think anybody could actually figure out, parse out what I believe based on the piece. The piece was just like, my opinion was just, I tried to get an array of voices, but my voice just really wasn't in it. But what people, you know, I was called a turf. Um, a lot of people, it's, you know, I'm, I'm friends with Jesse Single, and it's funny, he, he, gets, uh, he gets accused of being a chaser, and I get accused of being essentially like a, a, a turf, you know, and I think that's What's just What's a because, chaser? Sorry to interrupt you. A, 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 a trans chaser. Like, uh, like, like, like basically people say that the only reason Jesse reports on these issues is because he wants to have sex with trans women. So oh. he's a straight man. So, right. So he's tracing. You're right, right. So, so the criticism is like, it's so, it's so reductionist. It's like Jesse's, a, tr Jesse's a, a straight man, and so he's a chaser, and I'm a lesbian, and so I'm a turf. And it's just sort of people just decided, you know, just sort of like decided what the problem was. And they saw, they looked at me, and they saw like, oh, woman, short hair, lesbian, she's clearly a turf. Like she's jealous of trans. You know what I mean? Like, well, it's like just coming up any reason to dismiss you and to dismiss him because maybe right. you guys are putting forth narratives that right. some people don't want to hear. Right, totally. So there was a lot of that, a lot of, um, you know, sort of the standard stuff in terms of like, I shouldn't be writing on these issues because I'm not trans, um, which I reject that argument. I reject the idea that actors shouldn't play people of, you know, people of a different demographic. And I reject the idea that especially journalists shouldn't write about people of a demographic, different demographic. Um, so there was a lot of that. And again, there are good faith critiques of the piece, but most of this were like these sort of identity-based problems. And people were like, people were burning stacks of the paper and sending me videos of it. It was incredibly dramatic. I mean, I've I've like actually been book burned. <laughs> That's <laughs> crazy. I didn't yeah, realize yeah. that. Yeah, it was really nuts. People were were tweeting videos of of burning the paper. There were flyers up in my neighborhood calling me and the paper transphobic. Um, it was really just sort of like leaving my house for the couple weeks after that was just sort of terrifying. And I was freelancing at the time, so I wasn't working in an office or anything. And so it was this real sort of isolating experience where it just felt like everybody was mad. Everybody. I mean, the the burning of the paper thing is odd because, I mean, you're the one being vilified and called a bigot and whatnot, but I mean, are they, do they, are they not aware of what that symbolizes? Apparently not. Apparently <laughs> not. I know. I've always found that really disturbing, but there are this like sort of authoritarian impulse on the left that, you know, maybe it's not new, but it's not something that I was really aware of before then. Yeah. Um, so, so I'm, I'm really glad that this happened. And it also like, I'm sure that this would piss off everybody who, uh, who opposed me and, and heard it, but it was also really good for my career. Um, ultimately, I, you know, I got a staff job at the stranger. Um, subsequently, it wasn't just because of that piece, but that was sort of my introduction to them. And they saw that I have balls, which is or ovaries, which is something <laughs> that, um, <clears throat> that this paper appreciates. Yeah. Um, 
Yeah, and, and I did I did want to talk to you about this identity thing, which you just brought up, which is like, so nowadays the thing is that you're not supposed to talk about or write about or have opinions about particular identities, I guess you could call them, um, unless you yourself identify in that way. So like people right. who don't identify as trans aren't supposed to have opinions on transgenderism or gender identity, whatever you want to call it. Um, white writers aren't supposed to write characters of color, men aren't right. supposed to write about women, et cetera, et cetera. And it's, it's obviously a really great way to shut down um, mm -hmm. critical discussion and debate because like it's, I, I think it's framed as though the purpose is to allow marginalized populations to speak for themselves. Um, right. But in reality, it seems like it's about ensuring that only particular narratives around particular issues are around. So like, you know, the ways that I've experienced it um, are, you know, like if you're not a sex worker, you can't distress prostitution. If you don't work in porn, you can't talk about porn. If you're right. trans, you can't talk about gender identity. Um, but like, yeah, I mean, where do you think, I don't know if you have an answer for this, but where do you think this all comes from and like what's what's oh. the result been oh uh, where it comes from i don't know the answer to that i mean i guess you know some critical theorists would say that this is a it's all about subverting the power narrative um that i like don't speak postmodern and i don't speak theory and i don't really speak academic so when i hear things like that it just like sounds like a bunch of mumbo jumbo to me i mean my 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 take on a lot of social cultural issues is that these things tend to be memes, you know, um, child names, dog breeds, fashion, these things just, they just come and go. And I don't think that there's necessarily a reason for it all the time. Um, so maybe that's it. I don't really have an answer to that. I think, I hope that this is a temporary blip and that we will return at some point to a, uh, a more reasons um, discourse. But I don't know if we're going that direction because this is spreading. And I think a lot of this stuff probably started on university campuses, but then people graduate and they get jobs and they go to work and the nonprofits and the, and the government and the, and the cultural organizations that actually do make a difference in this world. And they bring those values with them. Um, I don't know where they're coming from. I like, to me, the idea that a straight person can't play a gay actor is ridiculous or that a journalist couldn't write about something is ridiculous and not just ridiculous but also the job of the journalist is to bring the stories of people who can't necessarily tell their own stories to the world and there's a lot of reasons that people can't tell their own stories a lot of it has to do with gatekeepers and positions of power for sure but don't we want those stories told anyway you know I mean if like the stories that going, the things going on with the the United States Mexican border. If only you know people separated from their children were allowed to tell these stories, these stories wouldn't be getting told. Like it's just such a dangerous precedent to set to say that you shouldn't be reporting on anybody who remotely has a different identity than you. I mean, like, am I only supposed to write about thirty five year old lesbians named Katie from North Carolina? That's fucking ridiculous. It would be so boring. There's like five of us. I've pulled all of this. <laughs> I've, I've, I've exhausted the, the I've exhausted us. <laughs> yeah. And I mean, I mean, and you wrote about the, what happened with the whole Covington High mess. Um, yeah, and I feel like what happened there is one of the negative impacts of identity politics and like sort of uh you know people reaching for a particular narrative instead of finding out what the actual narrative is um so yeah and i mean I, i'm assuming that people who are watching this video have followed the story but i mean essentially the real story of what happened was totally ignored in favor of this one particular image taken out of context and the response was like quite disturbing because you see adults saying like this 16 year old kid should be punched and things like yeah. that and they don't yeah. even they don't even know what happened and these are people who yeah. you know have huge followings and who are people who are who are respected in the media i guess like yeah it, it is it is disturbing and i wonder so when i first saw the when i first saw the um the, the tweet or whatever that was going viral. Like I know better than to take part in these online dog pile because I report on them and I see them all the time. And I know like by now I know the story is almost always different from whatever, whatever snippet, whatever meme goes viral. There's always more to the story. 
and like it just like I've reported on probably a dozen things like this in the past year. Every one of them has a has a deeper, more interesting narrative than the one that gets pushed. And so I know better than that. And yet, when this thing, you know, blew across my timeline, my boss, Dan Savage, tweeted it, and Dan is somebody I trust, and I just, like, retweeted it. And then I, like, you know, I sort of knew, like, you should probably wait. And so I wasn't surprised. What was the, it that you retweeted? I, it was the original It was the original thing that was going viral that was, like, so that said something about these kids, like, harassing and, uh, and mobbing the Native American guy. And then I ended up watching like the full hours and hours of footage, which was incredibly boring. And I saw in the footage, what I saw as has now been well established is that the narrative was totally different and that these kids were like the part that really struck me was that these the black Hebrew Israelites were saying like horribly homophobic, racist things to the natives. And these kids were defending gay people, which just like these kids in these MAGA hats defending gay people. And it just like really blew my mind in this way that was like, oh, my confirmation bias is the problem here. It's not actually theirs. I see that hat and I think you're a homophobe. And then I saw these kids like these, you know, these, these black Hebrew Israelites are saying horrible things about gay people. And these kids are actually defending gay people. And they seem just like I did when I was in college. And these street teachers would come to my school and we would do the same thing. And so that sort of broke open my echo chamber. But like it split my bubble a little bit. So I was able to watch the video. And I think a little bit with a little bit more of an open mind. That said, you know, I think that there's a couple reasons that people were so resistant to once the 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 narrative act like the actual narrative started spreading and there were you saw a lot of people doubling down and tripling down and and changing you know moving the goalposts so like first the problem was that these kids mobbed this native american guy and then the problem was that they were doing the tomahawk chop and then the problem was that the kids were wearing the maga hats you know it just like just the goalposts just kept kept moving until it got basically down to just like the way that they looked and I think there's a couple things going on there. The reasons people double down. I think some people are believers, are just like, you know, they just are like, they're just, they just believe, they buy the narrative that if like you're wearing this hat, there can only be one reason you're a racist and you're aware that you're a racist. And I think there are arguments that the hat is racist, but I don't think the argument, I don't think there's a fair argument that everybody who wears the hat wears the hat knowing that it's a symbol of racism. I think that, you know, the hat, can, like, it's in the eye of the beholder. Some people put it on because they, like, are racist, and some people put it on because they, like, actually just like Donald Trump and, like, want to make America great again. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Well, and it's, yeah, it's this desire to force people into boxes because right, it makes right. their world simpler and easier to understand. Yeah. And so there, and so there's this, so I think that's part of it. People are true believers. But I also think that, I think that humans have a terrible time with being wrong. And I sort of experienced this the other day when the uh, Jesse, I'm not, I don't know if I'm pronouncing his name correctly, but Jesse Smollett, Smollett, the guy from Empire. Okay. You know what I'm talking about? The guy who, the guy in Chicago. This who sounds was, familiar, but remind me. Okay, so there's um, a black gay actor named Jesse Smollett, but I'm probably mispronouncing his name. So he was in Chicago last week, and he reported a hate crime. He reported that he Oh, yes, of course, of course I did follow this. Right, okay. So my first reaction to that, my, like, initial reaction was, like, I'm going to need some more information on this. And I, it just, like, it my bullshit meter was just immediately up because the things that the the media were reporting was this sort of this cartoonish, like guys in MAGA hats at 2 a.m. in Chicago, uh, you know, put a noose on a black man, on a gay black man and then, and then like douse him in bleach. Like it's, that's so horrible that it's almost, it's like if you were going to like paint the picture of a hate crime, this would be it. Mm -hmm. And which puts my bullshit meter up. So, I wrote something about this, and this thing that I wrote ended up not being published for a couple different reasons. And then, like more, more news started to emerge, and that like some things emerged that like initially. Let me see if I can. Just, okay, so the the media reported that that these alleged perpetrators screamed something about MAGA country to this guy, and like, and I didn't I didn't believe it. And then because the Chicago PD put out a statement saying that he hadn't said this in his initial interview with the police. And I was like, all right, 
this is like we're on like something's up here. And then later, the Chicago PD reported that in a subsequent interview, he had he did say this. He did say that these perpetrators said something about MAGA country. And but I had already I had like in my mind, I had already decided like this is bullshit. And so when the cops released a subsequent statement, I like couldn't sleep that night because I was like I was wrong. The idea of being of of being wrong was so like like wounding to my like nobody knew that I had like these were private thoughts that I had. Nobody had read the post. Like nobody had like nobody knew what was going on in my head. But these these this idea that I had been wrong about this thing like I couldn't sleep that night. I kept waking up and being like I need to check the Chicago PD Twitter and find out what is the latest thing on this on this drama because I cannot be wrong about this. I just felt terrible about being wrong. You know, subsequently, now we don't even know if like the hate crime actually occurred. Like there's way more weird shit going on in this story than than we know right now. Maybe I wasn't wrong, maybe I was. But I had that experience of being like, okay, the, the just the feeling of being wrong was just like so so wounding to me in this way. And so I sort of felt a little bit of um, compassion for all the blue check mark assholes who doubled down on the Covington thing. So I was like, now I know what it's like to be wrong about something, even though I might not have been in the end. We'll yeah, see. well, and yeah, I mean, it's hard to, it's hard to publicly admit that we made a mistake. It's hard to publicly admit that we're wrong. I mean, I guess part of the fear is that maybe people won't trust us anymore. Right. So but the thing is, I don't think that's actually true, though. Like when you look at when you look at, at research on this, when people admit that they're wrong, it usually heightens their perception. Their, other people perceive them in a better light. Hmm. You know what I mean? So they're so the idea of admitting that you're wrong, it's I think it's personally very wounding. But when you do it, the rest of the world sort of looks at you as a person who can actually admit that they're wrong, which is a good thing. Yeah. And I mean, it, and it feels personally uh, liberating to use that word again, just because you sort of are like, oh, okay, it's okay, I can do this. I'm acknowledging that I'm human, and I, you know, you, I want people to think of me as human because you don't want to be, you don't want to be expected to be right all the time. That's way too much pressure. Right, right, and nobody is. Yeah. Nobody is right all the time. Yeah, but we do sort of have these ideas, like if you are, you know, it's the worst thing that you can be about something that's wrong. Yeah, I just realized I should probably just. Um, introduce my dog because I feel <laughs> like people who are going to be watching are going to be like this what? whole time like is yeah. she going to mention the fact that there's like this weird animal lying behind my head she just decided this is Emma hello um, Emma she just decided this was I mean it does look like this a cozy spot. spot but it's sort I, of also like a cat spot I would I would lay on that spot that yeah. looks very easy. anyway yeah. we can move on now I just I felt <laughs> I should like acknowledge her <laughs> um, yeah, so, like, the other thing that I wanted to talk to you about along these same lines, which is sort of this weird, I, I mean, you can explain what happened better than I'll be able to, but I, I that it was misreport, misreported, and then the wrong narrative just stuck around forever was this situation with Matthew Shepard. Oh, my God. Which oh you my wrote God. about, that which is... was so interesting, because when I read your article, I was like, what? Like, I had no I idea. Know. And so how do people I, not know this? I know. So I heard about this from uh, Wesley Yang, who um, is an incredible writer and thinker. Um, very, uh, he's he's really good. He's he's worth he's worth checking out. So um, it turns out Matthew Shepard, like his death wasn't a hate crime, and I just found this out this year, and it was like totally, totally mind blowing. So the, basically, the story is there um, a guy whose name I'm gonna I'm. I'm not remembering right now, but a um, a journalist went and spent like something like a decade researching uh, uh, what happened to Matthew Shepard, a gay guy who you know went to where where did this happen? Not Cody. Um, where did the Matthew Shepard thing happen? Uh, Laramie. I can't remember. La oh right, Laramie. yeah, yeah, right. Laramie. So he went and spent a ton of time in Laramie, and he um, and it Laramie, which you know when Matthew Shepard was killed 20 years ago, um, was sort of portrayed in the media as this hick town, as like a homophobic hick town. It turns out it's actually a college town. It's Wyoming, so it's still a college, you know, a small college, um, but it's actually a, a Wyoming college town, and college towns tend to not actually be that conservative. So for Wyoming, it's not actually that conservative. Anyway, so this guy went and he ended up writing a book about this. Um, looked like dug deep into the story of Matthew Shepard and the conclusion that he came to after interviewing tons of people, um, you know, digging into the records, doing his job, 
the conclusion that he came to was that Matthew Shepard wasn't killed because he was gay. In fact, one of the killers was his lover. He was killed over meth. He was involved in like the meth scene, and he and immediately after killing him, his his killers drove to his house to go steal a bunch of money, and they were pulled over by the police for a they they got in some other conflict. Anyway, um, so the, Emma, she's so, taking yeah. off. <laughs> um, so this. You know, and maybe there was some element of homophobia in the story or whatever, but it, according to this guy's research, and I think he's done better reporting on this than anybody, the heart of this crime was not about his, his identity as a gay man. It was about drugs. Um, and so so how, he, did that, how did the first narrative, like, how did it get, like, reported as a hate crime, and how did that well, just stick for so long? I mean, part of it was that, you know, I kind of hate to say this, but this sort of industry sprung up around this you know his parents got really involved um in the uh they the laramie project this sort of traveling um this like theater production um you know also so he had there was a couple guys in i don't know if they were local or if they were in like dc or somewhere but some gay activists got involved in this story and they sort of spun the narrative and i'm not saying that in terms of of like a I don't know if they were aware of the meth of the meth issue, but the narrative that that activists and his parents and the media all sort of clung to was that this was a hate crime. And I don't I'm not saying that there's a conspiracy um, because sometimes things just happen and there's no like actual conspiracy. But the narrative that spread was that was the one that we've had for the last 20 years was that he was killed because he was gay. And that's the only reason he was killed. He talked to the wrong guys in a bar. One of those guys was his lover. You know, and not that not that gay people or bisexual people can't have internal hom- internalized homophobia, but it just it complicates the narrative that we've been told for the past twenty years. It just, yeah, that was a really shocking revelation to mm-hmm. me. Yeah, same. Um, yeah, and he, I should also mention, he, you know, the author of this book was reviled in the gay press, um, media matter, also the non-gay press, media matters also called him terrible things, the advocate, like basically everybody tried to write him off, um, try to discredit him as, you know, the thing that people always do, they basically realize that you're a conservative, which is, yeah. Yeah, Yeah. right. So, and so do you, I was going to ask you, do people do that to you a lot? Like, so you're one of those people who's like, they can't put you in a box. So what do they decide about you? Yeah. Yeah. People think that I'm a conservative. They think it's so funny. I'll get like, you know, I'll get like last week I got, I got accused of being a Trump bootlicker. And the next day somebody sent me an email, an email that said, how does Hillary Clinton's asshole taste? Like I get really, I'm just like really getting it on both sides (laughs) of the political spectrum. They're both wrong. I hate both of them. Um, so yeah, no, I get accused of that all the time. A very easy way to dismiss people is to just call them conservatives. This is so uh, Jennifer um, Fitting Boylan writes for the uh, New York Times opinion section. A trans woman. I think she's a great writer. Did you see she wrote this thing about rapid onset gender dysphoria a couple weeks ago? No, no. Okay, so you know rapid. Ge- I'm sure you're okay. So for the audience, rapid onset gender dysphoria is essentially to vastly simplify it is this sort of a typology of a, of a small population of people who identify as transgender who maybe don't suffer from gender dysphoria, and they're usually teen females, natal girls, who, you know, get on Tumblr and then decide that they're trans. Um, what might colloquially be called, like, transgenders. Um, so this is something that a lot of people on, on the left are concerned about. Clinicians, parents, a lot of people on the left, but... Uh, this trans writer for the New York Times opinion section wrote this piece about how this this is a conservative. Only conservatives are are aware of this, are concerned about this, sort of like making it seem like it's a conservative plot. Sex researchers are not conservatives. They're just not. Like this is not coming from, and obviously, obviously there are a lot of tie-ins between some conservative and some some leftist beliefs in, in these like very narrow ways. Um, but this is something that a lot of people are, co- are concerned about. And when you just say, oh, it's conservatives and everybody on the left says like, oh, well, we don't have to validate it because this is a, this is a, this is a conservative thing. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's really frustrating um, because it's, I mean, first of all, because it's not true, but right. because I mean, like naturally, like it's, it just doesn't make any sense to me that people would think that a thing has to be either a conservative opinion or a progressive thing, because obviously there is going to be a lot of crossover. Like it's like all of my opinions are not going to fit within like the leftist right. framework. I mean, right. 
people right. are people and they're going to have all sorts of different opinions and most people in the world don't probably don't identify even as left or right to right, begin right. with yeah and i think it also misidentifies these cultural things that um that we're fighting about as political because we don't actually vote on right. on things like you know um whatever like we don't we don't vote on the annoying things that we fight on twitter about we vote about economic policy we you know the reason that we choose politicians might seem like it's about these cultural things, but for the most part, like at least in the U.S., the government isn't litigating those as much as they are things like taxes, healthcare. These like those are the reasons that you should vote. Which yeah, and I mean it. It makes sense that people would just have concerns about certain things or certain groups of people, regardless of their politics. Like it's like it makes sense that people would be concerned about what's happening to kids in terms of this. Um, gender identity thing and whether or not kids are being put on hormones and set onto a path towards surgery and things like that when they're quite young. Like, it doesn't make sense that that would necessarily come from any particular political ideology. It makes right. more sense that people would just be worried about the consequences of this thing or the repercussions. Right, right. But it's, yeah, it's really easy to, to just dismiss people by just accusing them of, of being conservative. I get it all the time. I get it accused of being conservative all the time. It's ridiculous. I, I don't think there's a really a single like policy position that I a right or like or any right wing policy positions that I actually believe in. I mean thing the way things are going right now with sort of the purity politics of the American left and this uh a lack of um commitment to things like due process and free speech certainly have me have me concerned. But I'm at this point I'm unwilling to, to uh um to uh concede those values as conservative values because I don't think they are well no and that's exactly I mean that's what's happened as a result of the left and progressives kind of wanting to pin certain ideas on the right is that then the left is scared to support these ideas so the left doesn't want to support free speech because that's a dog whistle for the right and the fe like feminists and or progressives and or liberals don't want to say the words due process because that's right. like a dog whistle for mras or whatever you want right. to call them right um, right and right. even things like even you know like for me i've been really frustrated because when i first started writing about um things like sex and sexuality and prostitution pornography from a feminist perspective, I always was really careful to say this isn't about morals, this is about politics. Mm -hmm. And then eventually mm -hmm. was like, well, wait a minute, like, why should I not have morals? Like, why do I have mm -hmm. to be afraid of this world? I, I mean, I tend to use the word ethics instead, because people associate the word morals right. with like the religious Religion. right. And I'm yeah. not religious at all. But at the same time, it's right. like, no, why do these people get to own that word or this idea? And why? Why, as people living in a society, should we be avoiding having ethics or having or caring about what's like right and, you know, just and good and um, and especially for people on the left or people who are progressive? It's like, well, you're you're claiming to want to be building a better society. So naturally, morals and ethics would come into that because it's about what you believe is right and good. It's about what you believe is an ethical way to treat other people. Right, right. I guess the problem is just that ethics are subjective. Yeah, of course. Um, and yeah, and of course, like radical feminists are always called conservative too and then when whenever we sh happen to share an opinion with right-wing people yeah. then it's like justification for all those people who said that it's like right. oh we knew it like these radical feminists as you just followed were on a, a panel hosted by the heritage foundation and none of them agreed with the politics of the people who were hosting the panel but it was just justification for people everywhere who right. support you know the gender identity ideology or whatever to say see these actually are right-wing people they're actually all right. racist they're all like whatever anti-immigration like yeah. any whatever whatever yeah. public whatever political positions you want to apply to the right now these people are are like that and yeah. they're just hateful and they're homophobic even though some of them were lesbians blah 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 right guilt by association is very in right now these sort of six degrees of even you know places like SPLC Southern Poverty Law Center sort of tying together people like you've uh, oh you've been on the you've been on someone's YouTube show and they had a sh and then they had Stephen Mulyu on you know what I mean just this like everybody's bad you can talk to anybody who's ever talked to anybody who's talked talk to anybody bad or like policing people's Twitter likes and Twitter followers and shit like that which I just find so ridiculous yeah this is 
not how we should be spending our time. No, yeah, the guilt by association thing is is brutal because it's like, well, I want to be free to talk to whoever I want and free to agree with things that they say or disagree with things that they say. And it's so weird to me that just having a conversation with somebody that you might disagree with on certain things or somebody who's like, you know, bad according to your friends or community or whatever also makes you bad and you need to be kicked out of the community as a result it's like so cultish to me yeah this just these sort of like these rumors just like percolate and nobody ever it's sort of they're just taken for granted you know like um it's taken for granted that you're transphobic it's taken for granted that i'm transphobic or jesse is transphobic without actually engaging with the ideas themselves it's just like it's like the sky is blue jesse single is transphobic like it's just it's just accepted because once you say something enough times on twitter and enough people with blue check marks repeat it then it's just like oh that's reality now and it drives me crazy because i think that the left should be I think the le- people on the left are generally speaking s- tend to be smarter and have a little bit more um sort of you know uh, uh, some critical thinking skills and I see that less and less every day because we're so afraid of being shunned by our own communities being dogpiled that people just don't stick their necks out and they just are willing to believe whatever Nicole Cliff or whoever the fuck says is real and which I like I'm I find appalling. I don't care who says something. Like it doesn't. I, even if it's somebody you trust, question it. Yeah. Um, I mean, I I I think I I used to think that people on the left were smarter than people on the right. But I mean, a I don't even like those categories anymore. I don't find them all that useful. But b I'm not sure if that's true. And it's not to say that people on the left are all stupid or that people on the right are all smart. I just think that people you know there's intelligent people on both sides and yeah. stupid people no. on both sides and I think yeah I think that's really true and and I don't think I believe that at all before um my you know my detransition piece came out um I think I was much more intractable about my views on the right now I think that like I find black conservatives not people like Candace Owens who I think is just uh probably um what's the word for her uh I don't think she's ideological. I think she's just like trying to make a name for herself. Um, but I do think that there are some really fascinating, especially, you know, African American thinkers on the right, um, or just people who are heterodox. Um, and I, I would have been completely unwilling to, to indulge in that before, you know, I sort of became persona non grata myself. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. Um, Okay, I mean, I did want to ask you one really important question before we wrap up. <laughs> the most hot topic and most important out of all of my questions today uh, is um, why does everyone hate Lena Dunham so much? Um, okay, so, okay, well, I know that you wrote about this. So. Can I tell you why I hate Lena Dunham and then I'll tell you why I think everybody else hates Lena Dunham? Yeah. Okay, so the reason I hate Lena Dunham is because She's a raging hypocrite. Um, so, for instance, she... Okay, so, you know Stephen Elliott? Okay, so Stephen Elliott is... Uh, he is suing the creator of the shitty media mint list. And he's a writer, he's a filmmaker, and I wrote a piece about, about Stephen. Um, I've written a couple of things about him. What did you say about Stephen? Because I did see that you'd written something about him, but I didn't actually get to read it yet. Okay, well, I've written a few things about him. So... Uh, so Stephen wrote. So the first thing I wrote about Stephen was um, uh, it was connected to um, so the University of Washington. Some students at the University of Washington made what's essentially a rape list, a, we- a website that was just a collection of, of anonymous allegations saying this person in this place could have been maybe people in Seattle, maybe somewhere wherever um, has you know is accused of this crime, and none of this was verified. It was just like put online, and I was incredibly appalled by this. I think it's a terrible idea for everybody involved. I don't think that we should have. And I understand why whisper networks exist. I think when I think there's a difference though between a whisper network and putting something online that hasn't been verified. Journalists shouldn't do it. Nobody should do it. Um, anyway, so Stephen was on the shitty miniamin list accused of rape. He uh, is insistent, and I believe him, that he's never raped anyone because no actual allegations have come out. And he's also written a lot about his own sex life, which is um, unconventional. Um, he's a like a he's like a baby bottom bitch. He like does not like to he does not he doesn't like to have like a, like what we consider like what what most people would consider sex. He doesn't have that. He likes to be like tied up like hog tied and whipped by dominant women. You know. Okay. Okay. 
Okay. So, so um, anyway, so he sued the creator of this list because his life, after he was named on the list, his life, as it tends to happen when you're um, accused of rape, he lost a lot of job opportunities and people disappeared, lost his agents, stuff like that. Um, and then, okay, so during this, uh, so Stephen sued... Um, sued Moyer Donegan, the, the creator of this list. And soon after that, Lena Dunham and every other blue check mark, uh, sort of liberal, neoliberal feminist came out and condemned Stephen Elliott, including Lena Dunham. And she said on Twitter something like, Stephen Elliott gave me a cup, a mug one time and I haven't been able to, to drink. I, it was like so creepy. I haven't been able to drink coffee out of it since. So Stephen sent me an email that Lena Dunham sent him where she was like profusely like complimenting him and saying like, I just broke my mug. Can you send me a new one? So I think she's just a big fucking liar. That's why I don't like her. Fair enough. Yeah. So I hate shit like that. Like she, I hate hypocrisy. And I, and I think that people, mm-hmm. I think that people who have experienced what it's like to be falsely. And I think Lena Dunham has been falsely accused across the political spectrum of shit that she's not guilty of. And I think when that, when that happens, the best case scenario is that, you grow from it and you see like this is what happens when you participate in dog piles this is what happens when especially if you have a big voice this is what happens this is and this is why you shouldn't do it Mm -hmm. and she has not learned that lesson instead she uses her 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 weight as a public figure to start dog piles of other people or to participate in them so that's why i don't personally like her however i wrote a piece about why people don't like her and that wasn't i didn't want my own opinion to be in it um but in the piece I think I said a couple things. For one, well, I think a big part of it is because she's unattractive in sort of the conventional way. I think Americans in particular like beautiful women and we are more forgiving of beautiful women and, and Lena Dunham might be a beautiful person on the inside, but she just doesn't fit our, our, like, our notions of what conventional beauty are. And I think people resent her for that um, and are less forgiving of women who aren't beautiful. Um, so I think that's part of it. But the, the other things, like, you know, she's constantly accused of, of being privileged, but she's actually not that privileged compared to other people in Hollywood. Mm-hmm. So she's super privileged compared to me. But compared to her own show, Allison Williams' father, who played Marnie on Girls, is uh, is a, an anchor on, like, ABC, is uh, Brian Williams. Um, the uh, David Mamet's daughter is in the show. Like, everybody in the show in her immediate circle actually had richer, more famous parents than she did. So, but we never hear about, you know, Julia Louis Dreyfus, her father's a billionaire. We just don't hear about these sort of these accusations of privilege unless they're targeted at somebody we, we don't already dislike. It's just sort of a convenient cudgel. And not that privilege doesn't exist, obviously it exists, but I just don't think that is the, is like a fair critique of her in particular. Yeah, I totally, I think that the fact that she's not, whatever, conventionally attractive is a bit, I've always thought that. It's like, because the way yeah. that people talk about her is with disgust. It's with disgust. It's with, it's with disgust. And she, you know, she doesn't do the thing that women are taught to do, which is when you have a disgusting body, you hide it. Not that I'm actually calling her body disgusting, but this idea that you should, um, she, she doesn't cover herself up, you know, she's like, she actually is sort of body positive in this way that people pretend to be body positive and then are disgusted by bodies because yeah. bodies can be disgusting, you know? Not yeah, I mean, I don't know. I kind of think that most bodies are a bit disgusting, yeah, to be honest. Are. I mean, and they do nasty shit. Bodies are really fucking gross. Like, Even really gross. attractive bodies are gross, for sure, for sure. Um, but that said, I so I think that a lot of the criticism of Lena Dunham is unfair, but the day that... So I posted this, this article about how... Um, it was called something like our dislike, our hatred of Lena Dunham says more about us than it does about her. Like an hour later, that issue of the Hollywood Reporter, where she wrote the um, she wrote the like editor's note. She edited this issue of like women in Hollywood, and she said this is an hour after my piece came out. She said that she had basically her her writer. Uh, Miles Murray, a writer for girls, was uh, you know accused of rape, and she basically says that she like when she was defending him, she like lied about it. She like made up that she had information. I'm like, I really wish I'd seen this before I fucking posted this because now it makes it makes it a lot harder for me to defend. Um, yeah. yeah, I don't think she's a great person, but I also think that if she's there's nothing more remarkable about, about her than there is about plenty of little starlets or starlets or whatever. I think she's a great writer. Um, I didn't read her book, but I read her sh- short stories in The New Yorker, which I 
I am jealous that, you know, she's younger than me. Fuck her for that. Mm -hmm. Um, Yeah, but I do think a lot of it is just, like, it's the way she looks. Yeah, I think she's quite talented. I think she's quite a good writer. I think that she's desperate to be liked, which leads her to be a hypocrite and to not be authentic and to keep trying to get into public favor, which is a quality that I really don't like because I would prefer that somebody just be honest and... Yeah. and have integrity than keep kind of trying to claw their way back yeah. in and that's making people dislike her more yeah, too I, I think because totally, they can feel the yeah, desperation totally and I you know I don't think apologize like in, in the moment that we're in right now I don't think that unless you you know if you've done something really heinous it's one thing but if you're like apologizing for wrong speak I don't know that that's ever going to benefit you it's just like blood in the water you just gotta like Stand by what you believe, you know? Yeah, yeah. And I see I see Lena Dunham doing that a lot. And I see Amy Schumer doing that a lot, too. And it drives me yeah. crazy. I'm like, stop apologizing. Stop sucking yeah. up. If you say yeah. something, yeah, believe it and stand by yeah. it. Unless you made a huge mistake, then admit right. your huge mistake. But d- stop just apologizing because people are getting angry at you. Like, you're not right. apologizing yeah. necessarily because I think you actually believe you did something wrong. It's because you're trying right. to placate the masses or placate your fans. And yeah, it's not going to work because they're just going to kind of see you as an easy target. They're like, yeah, oh, we can totally. push this person around and we still yeah. don't respect them. And Yeah, they're not going to like you because you apologize for saying that uh, Odell Beckham Jr. doesn't want to fuck you. Like that whole thing, do you remember when that's, like yeah. that whole thing to me was crazy. So she, she and Amy Schumer, I guess, were having a conversation and she was saying like, I was sitting next to this guy at an event, this like famous football player and I just felt like this slubby girl and he just like didn't want to fuck me which is probably true I mean like I I, that to me is like a pretty an experience that it seems like a lot of women could could relate to like you're you just like you don't feel hot you don't feel cool you don't feel like this guy wants you or this person wants you or whatever but instead of that being a relatable experience which is probably based in reality which is the reality that he probably doesn't want to have sex with her it got turned into this you know this this thing about the historical oppression of, of, you know, white feminism and et cetera. Yeah, it was very annoying to watch. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, don't like, apologize. What? <laughs> you, just, you. You, you don't need to feel bad about that. Feel bad about other shit, not that. Oh, Lord, the internet. What a mess. It's terrible. It's terrible. Um, Thank you so much for talking with me today. It was really fun, and I really appreciate your work, and I hope that we can talk again sometime. Yeah, definitely. Thank you so much for having me. Cool. Take care. Okay, you too. Bye-bye. Okay, bye.